If we were to travel round our entire coastland, we would see mountains nearly all the time. Yet a map of the island shows us that the highland areas almost enclose a central lowland. There is great variety in these highland areas. Let's look at them in turn. Still in the east, there are the mountains of Morn with their irregular skyline. Further south rise the Wicklow Mountains, a larger range of high, heather-covered summits with picturesque, boulder-strewn valleys. Ireland's highest mountains are in the southwest, a region of fine high ridge and deep valley scenery, scattered with many lakes. Its coastline is constantly battered by the Atlantic waves. Still in the west and further north, are the wild, boggy uplands of Mayo and Connemara. Ridged mountains have bare, rocky slopes which shine in the sun like glass. In the far northwest, in Donegal, the mountains are more rounded and regular and are covered with peaty moorland. Finally, in the northeast, there is the flat-topped plateau of Antrim, again with its windswept moorland. This plateau has a hard cap of basaltic rock, which protects the underlying rocks from erosion, so much of the surface water runs off in the form of waterfalls. On the north coast is the strange formation of basalt called the Giant's Causeway. Its column-like appearance resulted from the slow cooling of lava after it poured out of the Earth's crust millions of years ago. ...miles from west to east, and 50 miles from north to south. Much of this broad central lowland is covered with large shallow lakes. These lakes are linked by rivers and streams which meander sluggishly through the low-lying countryside. There are large areas of peat bog stretching as far as the eye can see. But the central lowland is not completely flat. It is interrupted by long winding ridges called eskers which were formed from gravel and stones left by subglacial streams during the Ice Age. In some places, the eskers have been quarried for building and road-making material. Limestone is the surface rock, but the water table is so high that small lakes are found here as well. Surrounded by the sea, and open to the prevailing winds which bring warm air from the southwest. Ireland has a mild climate, even in winter time. In the south, particularly, warmth loving shrubs and flowers grow wild in great profusion. Yet these same prevailing winds bring a great deal of rain and mist. The climate then is damp everywhere. Although the rainfall in the west is higher than in the more sheltered east. Let's see how this affects agriculture. Because this mild damp climate produces good grass, farming in Ireland is mainly concerned with the rearing of animals. Even in the exposed upland country of the west, with its poor grazing, sheep are reared on small craft farms. Some of the crofters' cottages are still roofed with thatch, 
tightly secured against the strong Atlantic winds. In the western lowlands, beef cattle are reared. Most of the young cattle are sold and sent to farms in the central lowlands. And then later to large estates in the east, where they are fattened on the rich pasture. These eastern grasslands with their fine turf have long been famous for the breeding of racehorses. Along the eastern coast with its lower rainfall, cereals such as barley can be grown. These arable crops are sown and harvested by both new and traditional methods, according to the size of the fields. Here in the east, the farms are mixed. Arable farming is combined with the rearing of pigs, some sheep and cattle, both for beef and for milk. But the part of Ireland most famous for its dairy farming is the Golden Vale of Tipperary, away to the south of the central lowlands. On the lush pastures of this fertile valley, many herds of dairy cattle are kept and are brought in for milking twice a day. Every morning the local creameries are busy with the carts and trailers bringing in milk from all the farms around. In the creamery, the milk is weighed and pasteurized. Some of it is then separated into skim milk and cream, and the cream is churned into butter. Surplus milk goes by tanker to larger creameries in towns such as Limerick. Here, much of it is made into cheese. Most of the cities and the larger towns of Ireland are in the eastern part, with only a few in the west. The coastal cities and the inland market towns play important parts in Ireland's economy, but in different ways. The market towns serve as centres for the surrounding countryside. On market days in towns in the central lowland, there is much selling and buying of cattle, which, as we have seen, move from west to east for fattening. In contrast, let's look at the cities on the east coast. First of all, at Dublin, the capital of the Republic. Dublin, with its wealth of fine buildings, is the largest city in the whole of Ireland. About one-fifth of the population of the Republic live here. Dublin's industries are mainly concerned with agricultural produce. At the vast Guinness Brewery, for instance, stout is made from malted barley. It is sent all over Ireland and is exported to many countries. Much of it goes to Britain in bulk containers. The distillation of whisky is another important industry in Dublin. Here again, 
barley is the raw material from which the whiskey is distilled. After maturing, a great deal of Irish whiskey is exported, much of it to America. There are a number of large bacon curing and meat packing factories where pigs and beef cattle from the central lowlands are slaughtered and prepared for export. The busy city of Belfast is the capital of Northern Ireland. Here the main industries are quite different from those of Dublin. The wide, deep, sheltered expanse of Belfast Lock is an ideal site for the construction of ships. In fact, the Belfast shipyard is one of the largest in the British Isles. Sections of the ships are first built up under cover. As the sections are completed, they are taken to a slipway to be welded into position. On flat ground adjoining the lock, there is a large aircraft factory. Although this industry was established much more recently than that of shipbuilding, aircraft are now one of Belfast's main exports. But the product for which Belfast has long been famous is woven in mills, not only in the city, but in towns nearby. Some of the finest quality linen is still painted by hand. Now, at Ireland's resources of fuel and power, her most abundant natural fuel is turf or peat caught from the bog, and there is plenty of it. Pieces of cut turf are left to dry. Then they are ready for use as fuel. But nowadays, electricity is available even to the crafts in the remote west. Some of it is supplied by hydroelectric power stations built to harness the large quantities of water in the rivers and lakes of the central lowlands. Power stations in the city ports of Belfast and Dublin use imported fuels, coal and oil. Power is derived from her one abundant natural resource, the peat bogs. Large areas have been diked and drained. When the peat is dry, it is milled from the surface by specially designed machinery. Power stations have been built on the bogs themselves to make direct use of the fuel. When the milled peat has dried out, it is brought in along rail tracks and fed into the furnaces. The development of hydroelectric and peat-fired power stations, more cross-country power lines are being built. In some ways, the island is still divided into two. 
The majority of the Irish people are Roman Catholic in religion. They live mainly in the Republic, the larger part, with its government in Dublin. On the other hand, most of the Protestants live in Northern Ireland, a part of the United Kingdom, governed from Belfast. Consequently, the country is divided by a frontier, with customs posts on either side. Both parts of Ireland look eastward for trade. Through the eastern ports pass the produce of the countryside. Meat, both on the hoof and already slaughtered. Cheese from the big creameries and rich Irish butter from dairy regions such as the Golden Vale. Much of this food finds its way to shops in Britain Into the same parts come the goods that Ireland needs, such as wheat for bread and grain for animal foodstuffs, or fertilizer to improve the land for farming. From Britain comes coal for fuel and the production of gas and electricity, oil and spirit for transport, and for the oil fire at power stations. Iron and steel in many forms. And materials such as cement for use in building. From Britain too, thousands of visitors come every year, many with their cars and caravans. To the intercontinental airport at Shannon, come planes bringing visitors from all over the world. From other airports, there are frequent services to and from Britain and the continent of Europe. The tourist industry grows bigger every year because of the variety that Ireland offers the holiday makers. Visitors are attracted, too, by the peace and charm of her scenery. Touring by car is especially popular. Because Ireland's population is small, there is plenty of room on her roads, and horse-drawn vehicles are still common. Sites like this and the many remains of Ireland's ancient history add to the attractions for the visitors. But despite developments in tourism and industry, and despite the political division, the basis of the economy of the whole island remains in the small landowner who gains his livelihood by farming this green land.